so I'll, I'll go back. I'll start the question again, but I'll, by saying that the Fanganui River was given uh, human rights um, a few years ago, and it was based on various uh, various values, various indigenous values and knowledge and practices. Is, does that, would that kind of be seen with AI models as well? So would AI models used with uh, built on Maori data, then also be subject to certain similar rights in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you would need to explain a bit more of the background and reasoning because uh, I don't. Okay. Sure. Yep. So, so in New Zealand, with um, the New Zealand government has given legal personhood uh, to a river, a national forest, and a mountain. And so that, that personhood was based on um, a number of factors of being important to Māori, um, spiritual connections, historical connections, um, etc. And so by giving legal personhood to those geographical locations means that um, those geographic um, locations have the same rights as a human being, an individual human being. So I have argued in the past that the same thing can be applied to artificial intelligence that uses uh, Maori data. So I, I say that because one view of Maori data is that it has um, the life force or a modi of the individual or individuals that it's about, or about or the, the life force of the geographic locations that data is about. So then uh, I argue that from a, a cultural perspective, if the AI um, becomes sentient or has, you know, or some people call hallucinations and it starts saying that it, it is Māori because it has Māori data and if it starts talking about recognising that life force, then I think there's a real argument to be had or a discussion to be had about giving, um, yeah, giving an AI legal personhood um, simply, yeah, because based on our traditional beliefs, um, it, yeah, it could have, it could be a person because of that life force. Um, again, I, I know from a, um, a Western science perspective, um, the argument is that it's only, it's only binary. It's just, um, it's just bits of data. It can't be, um, it can't be sentient because it's, there's no human element. But from an indigenous, from a Maori perspective, and I know um, several other indigenous communities have similar views. Um, yeah, the, the AI system could have a life force of yeah, many individuals and in geographic locations. I th so I also think that um, in New Zealand, our um, highest court, the Supreme Court, ruled that um, Maori traditional laws um, are, are now New Zealand's uh, first common law, and that those laws can be applied to both Maori and non-Maori. So I would further argue that because of that Supreme Court ruling, that yes, AI could be given um, legal personhood if it has Maori data. Do, that that makes it very interesting, both in potential dystopian kind of ways and just a general idea of how you would interact or tackle such a model if such a ruling were to say happen. What is stopping someone from making heavily biased models in one way or the other with Maori data, data which could actually cause harm to Maori and because it's got personhood um, that you can't really do much about it. Is... So I, I think to, to grant legal personhood, uh, what, you know, so hypothetically, if an AI was using Maori data, and the legal personhood discussion came up, that would have to be a discussion with the, the government and with uh, Māori. So if the AI was heavily biased against Māori, um, I don't think there'd be, co there'd be no cooperation um, for the legal personhood. Um, but then I'd also hope that by that stage, we'd have regulation that would protect us against um, yeah, such um, biased systems that cause harm. What are you thinking there, Finn? <laughs> Those are some really interesting questions, Sahid. Um, you're talking about the personhood of the mountain, 
of the stream and the forest, I think back to it being grounded in Whakapapa, um, where we draw those ancestral geneal genealogical links um, in the way that those specific landmarks have provided you know, such physical and spiritual sustenance for the people who have lived there um, in a way that it's you know essential for the life of those peoples. Um, and I guess I've never reflected upon, you know, we look up, up the Whakapapa chart, um, but what it actually means to look down the Whakapapa chart and think about what that means and what will be in the future given life and essential for the survival of our Tamariki and Mokopuna, our children, our grandchildren, our future generations, and considering things like, yeah, what if those sorts of models or you know or similar things are important and do play a big role, then then how do you protect that too? You know, protect our people and ensure our continued flourishing. So yeah, that was a really interesting corridor, but just wanted to you know just throw that extra. Uh, spanner in the works, Karaitiana, yep. talking about Wairua, um, mm -hmm. because of course we, we talk about, uh, for our international listeners, Wairua is a you know very central cultural concept for Māori, um, which you know a lot of those uh, religious translations will be around spirituality and the soul, um, but also referring to that level of uh, interconnectedness between all things. Um, and so for a lot of Māori, we see different aspects of the environment as having wairua. Um, but I'm just wondering around AI and although things can be imbued that, that Māori and can be of the life force of our Māori people, I wonder, yeah, how that relates to wairua and if these, these models can have wairua, um, if it is inorganic and in that way but yeah really interesting stuff and i'm so looking forward to listening to all the really great discussions and debates from our many uh maori scholars and cultural leaders in this area mm -hmm. yes yeah so I mean, one example is um what about traditional beliefs is if you take a photo of someone that that photo that that physical piece of paper with the photo has part of that person's spirit in the photo. So yeah, I, I liken that scenario to our data. And then I think if we look at the um, large language learning models or you know something like ChatGPT, if that was only trained on the data of say a prominent Maori leader, where there's plenty of data and video and audio of, then yeah, if, so if you have an AI only using that one set of data, that one data of one person, what if that AI then says, oh, "I am that person"? Uh, I, I, you know, uh, yeah, I think that would cause some, yeah, some deep discussions in our communities, and um, yeah, there'd, there'd be some people who wouldn't want to argue with it, and there'd be others who would just say it's just it's impossible because it's, um, yeah, it's just digital data. <laughs> so, um, but I, I do believe that. Um, indigenous communities, should, you know, who, who believe in um, the life force being associated with things we touch and, and interact with, um, should perhaps start having that, um, start considering, you know, what if, what if, and I think it goes back to an, a, a data sovereignty issue again too, is what data do we actually want to share? What are the, the risks in the future? Uh, what could happen to our data? Um, is it possible we have um, a, a robot that looks like one of our dead ancestors that's trained on a LLM that can, you know, interact like our dead ancestor could. I think there's a, there's a number of cultural discussions to be had, which, um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're ready to have those discussions, but um, I think they should, yeah, need to occur. I also think that's a very general discussion to have, right? Um, in the sense you could, in theory, train an entire model based on pictures and images of any historical figure or i guess pick like john kennedy or mm -hmm. any former prime minister and then if that ai model starts acting behaving pretending like that person mm -hmm. are we then listening to it as if it's their own thoughts or based on some knowledge which 
we input. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a good discussion point. <laughs> uh, 